Hi everyone, Jody Bentley here and welcome to the wellness webinar series. I am so excited for our uh, final guest today. Um, this is a topic that I am really excited to dig deep into and I know you are too, so I'm just gonna bring her on in. Let's welcome Brooke and Haney. I feel like I need a sound effect of like clapping. <laughs> Next time. I'll get it next time. Uh, first of all, if, you, if you're there, let us know that you can just see us and hear us just to appease my Virgo brain. Let me know that um, uh, you can see us and hear us as we're moving forward. And let me see. I think we're good. People are liking everything. Okay, great. Hey. So, okay, great. Katie said, let's do it. Let's do it. Great. Hi, Katie. Hi, Amber. All right. So let me introduce uh, Brooke to you all. This is Brooke M. Haney. Um, she uses pronouns she and her. Uh, she's a New York City-based intimacy choreographer and actor. Um, she's worked internationally, actually, in the Philippines, Switzerland. She's worked regionally in Seattle, Boston, Orlando, and Kentucky. You've worked in a lot of places. She's mm -hmm. learned her MFA in performance at the University of Central Florida in partnership with the Orlando Shakespeare Theater. And she studied with theatrical intimacy education in Judy Auckland of Intimacy, intimacy Directors International. She's a member of the NYC acting company Only Make Believe and is an adjunct professor of acting at Marymount Manhattan College. And Brooks, I think this is probably your quote, Brooke, uh, consent is sexy. I love it. And I can't wait to talk about it today. Um, I, I can totally claim it. <laughs> but I will. What's that? I said I think others have said it too, but wow. yes, yeah, I say it. Often. Yeah, we're giving you credit. We we'll give you credit on this one. Um, so wonderful. I'm so again. I'm just so thrilled that you're here. I think this is such um, an important conversation to be having right now. Um, so just just tell us, like, how did you how did you get involved uh, in, to do this? How did you become an intimacy choreographer? Because like, I'll just be honest. You know, like right after the Me Too movement happened, I feel like I started hearing about intimacy choreographers, intimacy coordinators, mm -hmm. and I was like, oh, this is a whole new field. Um, but I think I'm wrong in that. So why don't you why don't you fill us on in and sort of a little bit about what you do and how you got into it? Sure. Um, first, I want to say thanks for having me. And yeah. <laughs> this whole series has been so awesome. I love how you're just finding a way to give service to your oh. community. And that's really awesome. Thanks. Um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I think you're not in the minority. I think a lot of people started hearing about this work uh, post the Me Too movement mm -hmm. and for good reason. Um, but it has existed before that. Um, I started in working in this way about six years ago. Oh, okay. That said, there are people, plenty of people doing it far before I were, I was. Mm -hmm. It just, um, we've started paying people for it recently. Which I think is different. <laughs> And I think the Me Too movement has been a, a part of that for sure. Yep. Uh, I started in part because I, as as you know, because we met in an acting class. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an actor, and my type tends to be uh, like battered wife. Mm -hmm. I play a lot of roles that involve sexual violence. I also play some leading lady roles. My, my very first kiss ever was on stage. Oh my uh, god. <laughs> and I'm queer and my first kiss with a woman was also on stage. Oh my god. <laughs> so uh yeah, I had I was playing a lot of roles requiring intimacy and a lot of roles that required a lot of vulnerability. Yeah, sure. And for me, this work started at with the, the part about vulnerability and trauma. Okay. I was feeling like I remember even back when I was an undergrad mm -hmm. being like, what if I go there? and I can't get back. Like, and then I have to go to math class, <laughs> you know? Sure, um, sure. <laughs> so I kind of, as my career progressed and those were the roles I started playing, I, I started thinking, I really need a technique that is a self-care technique that I know I can do to bring myself back from a really hard role. Yeah, so totally. Me, this work started by creating an actor warm down which is a thing that I now teach that's like a 20 minute practice based on um, the idea that if you're in flight or flight mode, it takes 20 minutes physiologically for your adrenaline to go down. Wow. So okay. if you really choose to go somewhere uh, in a rehearsal or a performance and for whatever reason you're triggered or whatever, right. you've got a practice that brings you back. So that was actually my way in, though I don't think of it as the primary part of my job at all now. Oh, 
huh, okay. Uh, I think of my job now as dealing with boundaries and consent and the visual storytelling of intimacy. Hmm. Um, and I think so closely related to this idea of I need to take care of myself after a rehearsal or performance became we as artists need to be able to take care of ourselves during rehearsal and performance. Yeah. And I am a big component of affirmative consent. Mm -hmm. And so that was the second part of it for me was how do we bring informative consent into the rehearsal room? You know, we, I feel most actors, we've been raised in a culture and by raised, I mean like, as children, but also in the theater of yes and. Mm -hmm. Sure. And there are so many actors. I think when I was an undergrad, my senior year, um, I had like a senior seminar where John Jory was our professor. And I think he gave us the statistic at the time that like 11% of Actors' Equity members were employed. Yeah. That there was 89% sure. unemployment rate. Uh -huh. And that yeah. creates in us this desire to say, I will do anything. Give me the job. Right. Yep. And one of the great things to think about this work is that we are giving actors the reminder that that is not how it needs to be. I love that. That, that boundaries are perfect wherever they are. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Let's let's keep talking about boundaries. I like the boundaries. Great. I talk to my clients all the time about boundaries, and it's so important. But you're actually you're you're so right. You know, even when a client comes to me and I even say, "What do you want to do?" Like anything, just pay me, right? We have that because we just want to work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we'll get into you know the state of the industry in, in a little bit. I don't want to, go, want to go there right now, but there's that. But I'm sure there's that feeling now. We haven't worked in so many months. It's like absolutely. We, want to work but so so okay so can you just get a little clearer on um uh, what do you mean by like how how can i set boundaries for myself on set what does that mean mm -hmm. um what is what does affirmative consent mean what does that look like on set um and i guess how would you how do you do that as an intimacy choreographer or how Wait. do you support that yeah i hear a few different questions so to me yeah. affirmative there's like 42 <laughs> questions bro go yeah. um Affirmative consent to me means that consent is not happening unless we are actually saying yes. Okay. Right? Okay. I mean, that's a very simplified version of it, but like <clears throat> silence isn't consent. You need to affirm your consent, right? Mm -hmm. Enthusiastically. Um, <laughs> and I, I really mean that. I don't just mean that like in the bedroom. I mean that on set, like do the things that you are excited to do. Mm -hmm. Not the thing that you're like, I guess I would do this. Because right. someone else will be excited to do it. And if you honor who you are, that work will be there. Sure. sure. Um, so then I, the other question I heard was, how do I handle it on set? And how does an actor handle it on set? Yes. Because there's not always an intimacy choreographer. Right. Um, and maybe really quick, let's talk terminology really quick. I okay. love the word intimacy choreographer. Okay. It really puts the focus on this is choreography that is repeatable. Mm. Uh, other terms that you will often hear are intimacy coordinator, and yeah. that is the same job on camera. Okay. When you Got look it. at the SAG AFTRA protocols, their protocols are for an intimacy coordinator. Got it. Um, intimacy director is often the title used in the theater, um, oh. in part because Claire Warden, who was the first intimacy director on Broadway, is what it's what she put in her bio, and <laughs> and. <laughs> It is standard, or at least that's my understanding of it. Like, yeah. it's paved the way, and now that is what we call each other. And I also love intimacy choreographer, which I learned about from Laura Rickard at uh, Theatrical Intimacy Education. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in every intimacy choreographer is gonna work a little differently. Okay. But you can expect some sort of a boundary setting practice if you're working with one. All right. And I'm not gonna go into exactly how my boundary setting practice works because that's like a 30 minute workshop to learn. <laughs> it. And then it's three minutes, right? Uh -huh. But all about uh, articulating for your partner what parts of your body you're willing to have touched and in what way, mm. and which ways you're okay with improvisationally and which ways you're okay uh, only if it's choreographed. Got it. So, for example, for me, for whatever reason, if someone like taps, smacks my hand gently, uh -huh. that is a thing I do not like if I don't know it's coming. <laughs> Got so, it. Even though, even though that does not hurt, right? So right. I might say like, 
uh, I don't mind, you know, a little slap, but I need that part to be choreographed. However, I'm totally fine improvisationally with, uh, you know, medium skin contact on my arm or whatever. But we would use some sort of a boundary setting practice to make it clear to each other what each of us is comfortable with. And it goes both ways, right? This is not a um, victim perpetrator. We are scene partners, right? Regardless of which roles. Right, right. So both, I might say to you, uh, yeah, you may, you can touch my head and my hair and my face. Uh, I don't want anything to go in my mouth. Um, front of chest is okay. And you might say, I don't want to touch your front of chest. And I would say, okay. Um, you know, and then we'll just move on. Got it. And can I just ask, like, is this, um, uh, like, I'm just thinking of like so many different roles now popping in my head. Like I just watched, um, normal people, you know, that was very, those wow. Very raw and intimate, but then I'm also thinking of like Big Little Lies and some of the scenes mm -hmm. Nicole Kidman had with Alexander Skarsgård, and like those were, you know, intimate but very rough. So it's like I guess for me in my head, I've always thought of intimacy choreography coordinator director just being about sex scenes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Oh. Am I wrong in that? Yes, I'm That's so glad you the question. Um, so if it's a fight scene, if it's mm -hmm. sexual violence, then. Yeah then you either need an intimacy choreographer who is also a fight director mm. or you need both. Okay. Right. Okay. Got it. Um, that said, that definitely needs an intimacy choreographer because it's not the same as a fist fight, right? Right. right. To it. Yeah. Similarly, um, other things that people don't always think about is I'm sometimes asked to work on something that's a scene about a medical situation. Oh yeah. Right because that's still two people touching each other in an intimate way. I can right. sit in the work, any kind of touch with heightened emotion. Mm. Okay, okay, got it, if, that's clear. So it could even be like familial, if it's like a small child and a grown adult, they're not really related. Mm -hmm. So we come in and we talk to the kid about, you know, uh, is this okay with you? And, you know, and yep. we, we do consent practices. That's great. That's um, great. Uh, just to what we're talking about, I'm going to post this question from Katie up on, on the screen here. She says, how do you set boundaries when there isn't an intimacy, intimacy choreographer on set? There's always a piece of me that's worried about rocking the boat with the director. We, we just was talk, talking about this, right? We, yeah. we, uh, we want to be good people pleasing actors, right? Who are my people pleasing actors out there? It's all of us, but we get, yeah, but this is such a fascinating conversation. So what do you say to that? Thank you, Katie. That's such a great question. I feel like that was along the lines of the second half of your question. And mm -hmm. I want to say to you, be brave. Mm. The industry is changing and it's not perfect yet. Um, and it's going to be scary at times. We have been so conditioned to please. And, and it's going to take work to listen to ourselves and trust ourselves. Mm -hmm. And my great hope for the future and this is already happening at Marymount where I teach college, we'll start teaching this practice as like training for every actor, every director, every stage manager. Oh, yeah. So will actually change. And this fear of rocking the boat or being hard to work with or whatever eventually won't go away. But change can be uncomfortable. Yeah. As we and know, <laughs> I think you can know that every time you stand up for yourself, you are also being an activist for someone else. And there's ways of doing it positively and respectfully. Um, you know, like our bodies are our instrument. Mm -hmm. We would not take, I played piano growing up. Mm -hmm. I would never have taken my personal family piano and like set it on fire, you know, for art. So that might be someone's art. and good job, I'd love to see it. Um, <laughs> but like, I took care of that piano, we got it tuned, we oiled the wood, you know, we took care of it. It was, it was probably the most expensive thing my family owned. Wow. And that's what our bodies are. Mm -hmm. Our bodies are the most precious thing <laughs> that we have. So what I would say is communication is everything in any good relationship. Um, <laughs> the sooner you can articulate your boundaries, the better. So one is opting into projects you want to be a part of. Mm. Um, if a project 
is the union. It's going to tell you up front, like if there's nudity, which also we didn't say this earlier, like mm. that's also what intimacy choreographers work on is any project involving nudity. Um, and nudity is defined to me as any time you're wearing less clothes than you would wear to rehearsal. So taking off your shirt, taking clothes off, any of that. God, uh, not necessarily make, make them. Not just necessarily make it, yeah. yeah. Um, so part of it is when you read a casting call and it says there will be partial nudity, check in with yourself and see how you feel about that really. Mm -hmm. And do you have more questions and it's okay to ask? Well, and that's part of an intimacy choreographer's job is to explain to you what that, what's the storytelling reason for the nudity? <clears throat> what will, what, if it's before on camera, what the shot will be? Right. How we're telling the story. So you're not spending time worrying about that. Mm -hmm. But the first thing we can do as actors is check in with what we really want to do and mm -hmm. then communicate that early and upfront. Mm -hmm. The hardest time is when the camera just starts rolling. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and to that end too, I think some people are like afraid to tell their agents or managers, don't submit me for this yeah. because they don't want to miss out on opportunities. Mm -hmm. But if you're not comfortable with something, you know, you've got to say up front, don't submit me for, you know, I mean, if, if you don't want to do nudity, don't do Game of Thrones, you know, <laughs> like don't do those things. Like, you know, you know the shows that it is. So you've got to be up front of it with your team about that stuff too. And I think there's power in that. Mm -hmm. Because doing the projects that you that really feed you and you're really excited about, yeah. that energy grows. I about two years ago, I was really frustrated that I wasn't get, getting to play very many queer characters. Mm. And I chalked it up to I'm very straight passing and it probably just wasn't gonna happen for me very much. And uh, a good friend who is also a manager said to me, well, we just need to like start saying no to things that aren't that. <laughs> um, the things that are and I've done probably I don't know five or eight queer characters in the last year <laughs> the power of no the power of no so if you say no to this role that doesn't seem right for you it will be right for someone else and you've left space for the one that is right for you yeah exactly and then I think also we can think of boundaries as a gift Right. If you and I are scene partners and you're like, what's OK? And I'm like, if I'm good with anything. It's very hard to believe that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I often use the, the, the joke like, really, are you good with anything? Like I can put my toe in your mouth <laughs> like, without any pre-planning. Right. <laughs> Everyone has boundaries. And yeah. I've choreographed a toe in the mouth. Like that's not a thing that doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> I did a production of Belleville a couple of years ago that involved someone sucking wow. on someone's toe. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that happens. So boundaries are a gift and to be the first person, if you don't have an intimacy choreographer, to go to your scene partner and be like, hey, just so you know, I'm totally cool with you touching me. And you can show on your body, like I'm cool being touched here, uh, here, uh, on my arms, uh, front of chest is fine, front of pelvis is not. And I totally recommend desexualizing the language. Mm. Don't assume genitalia. Right? Yeah. Um, uh, Chelsea Pace and Laura Rickard of Theatrical Intimacy Education is who really turned me on to that. And I just think it's the best. Um, yeah, we can be totally sexual when we're doing our table work, mm -hmm. but when we're talking about our and our partner's bodies, we desexualize it. I so, love that. you know, like, so, like, or I'm only okay with front of pelvis if it's choreographed or something, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, being clear, if you say that to your partner, then you can go, what are your boundaries? And because you've led by example and said, here's where I'm at, it gives them the freedom to be like, oh, great. Yeah, uh, I, I'm i okay with it. And then they give their boundaries. And then a beautiful thing is is at the end to be like, and if it changes, let me know. Because it that. can always be revoked. That, that's a really important thing to remember. Yeah really important thing um yeah it, it's yeah it sounds it's so crazy it's such a crazy thing like, again watching you know normal people or all these like really intimate things and I, I've only done a couple intimate scenes on set I'm usually you know 
the bitchy mean woman, so I don't get to kiss people. Um, but a couple times I have. Um, but it's but you know, directors don't necessarily step in. They're just talking about camera angles and what they want. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being there at the actor, like, uh, okay, so how do we wanna how do you wanna do that? And it was just so awkward, you know. I mean, it ended up being fine because it is I, I love that you said desexualize it. I felt like that's what we, he and I had both done. It was like, okay, this is the job and this, you know, you can put your hands here and that's okay. But it's, it's just, you know, when you don't have guidance, it just feels so awkward with another human to be like, all right, we're going to make out now really hard. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? But how do we talk about that? So yeah. And we would never go cool. There's a fight here. So go ahead. Just um, beat each other up. Right. Right. We don't assume that right. two actors should do that. Yeah. Um, and the truth is the part of the big reason I love this craft, I'm, I think the artist side of me likes one side and the activist side likes another. The activist loves the consent and boundaries. Yeah. The artist in me loves the visual storytelling. Yeah. This sure. idea that we don't actually want to ask actors to draw on their own experience when it comes to intimacy. Mm -hmm. because what are the chances that that actor's own experience is exactly the way this character would do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So the intimacy choreographer's job is to be this outside eye that guides it so that we're telling the story the way it's best told mm -hmm. if yeah. you're actually busy negotiating like we're, we're professional here right like this is just okay good good so let's go it you know you can't right. see what's happening yeah um, and uh oh what was normal people i actually think if anyone's interested in seeing like different characters the intimacy in that show i think Ooh. is glorious mm -hmm. Watch, like even just like how between the different characters you see such different relationships through the intimacy. Yeah. It's really yeah. incredible. It is. Um, and Alana had a question too. I haven't watched 365 days, but she says, I just watched 365 days. It was even deeper explicit than 50 shades of gray. I'm so curious in how those things are handled on set. Can you talk about that? Um, because I, I, to that end, I felt normal people was very, uh, yeah. Explicit, right, and very raw. The way even they shot it with hardly music, on no music, and you could hear breathing and the breath. Like it was very yeah. vulnerable. Yeah. Have you, did you see Three Sixty Five Days? I don't know what no. she's talking about. Alana, maybe comment if I'm wrong. I'm going to assume that Three Hundred Sixty Five Days has a kink component since you compared it to Fifty Six Shades of Grey. Is that true? Uh, we have like we have like about a twenty second delay in That's our right. video. I'll so we're talking about that. Yeah, well, um. Let's see what she says. I'll put I'll put this back. So yeah, we'll see what she says and we'll come back to that question. Cause I'm sure that would be a different Yeah. Thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. What you said though about breath is so interesting. Um, because when I think of the different like ingredients of intimacy, breath mm -hmm. is one of them. Breath is one, sound mm -hmm. is one. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently, well, it's been a while now, because <laughs> we've been in quarantine for months, <laughs> um, choreographed a birth scene. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. And a lot of that, there wasn't a ton of movement, but we did a lot with breath and a lot with sound. Yeah. Um, yeah. It can be, think about how vulnerable sound is. Mm -hmm. sound. Like, so we, you know, and that could be the same if you're choreographing um, the sounds of an orgasm. Right. 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 Walking, we can walk through that. So someone doesn't have to like improvise their own understanding of orgasm right right i know yeah it was like, yeah i always wonder how those things are done so you're so okay so you're saying even that stuff like that's talked through so it's not just like i just imagine like because my whole experience is just actors thrown together and be like go make it look real do you know what i mean yes jody that is my experience too i have never yet as an actor had an intimacy director choreographer or coordinator on any project i've worked on Wow. So I hear you. Change comes yeah. slow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's exciting. Um, okay. Alana did say yes. So I think there is a, a kink component to it. She said, it's like the guy kidnaps a woman. She has serious advice to fall in love with him. There's a lot of sex involved. That's basically the guy's tool to make her fall in love. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Got it. Got it. So, and, and yeah. Is your, how is that handled on set? Yeah. How, like how I'm so curious of how those things are handled on set. So kind of what we're talking mm -hmm. about really intimate things and you know yeah. having orgasms doing you know uh all of that like it's just so fast I and mean, i'm still my brain is still caught up on the like it's all choreographed you know like how fascinating yeah i think 
Uh, so full disclosure, I work primarily in the theater. The work that I've done on camera has mostly been consulting work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have an understanding of it. So I'm going to talk from an understanding. And there are people that are bigger experts on this than me. Okay. Um, a big portion of on camera work is about the communication. It's about the intimacy choreographer or coordinator in this case, the intimacy coordinator talking with the director uh, and getting an idea of what the vision is and then having a conversation with the actor about what they can expect as far as framing amount of clothes, what we're going to see and then potentially choreographing it as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge part about it. Um, if we're talking a kink component, I think that gets into, uh, oh, let me back up a little bit. Often if you're in that, if it's on set or in rehearsal for a, pro a project and there's that kind of intense intimacy and nudity, mm -hmm. you can also expect a closed set, meaning only right. people who are absolutely mm -hmm. be there are there. Mm -hmm. You can expect um, a robe for when we cut so that you're not just sitting there waiting for the next take mm -hmm. and you are expected to put it on. Mm -hmm. Like actually just being like, I'm good is actually not considered particularly best practices. Like mm -hmm. you put it and you put it on. Um, and you can expect that you will have, that a conversation will have been had with you and with everyone involved because everyone that is involved needs to consent to this, either to participating in it or into observing it. Um, so that if there's a kink component that gets to like when you're looking for who the intimacy choreographer is, uh, different choreographers have different specialties. Mm, okay. When I think of my work, I primarily work in sexual trauma, uh, any kind of vanilla, anything. Um, I work in BDSM and kink a bit, and I love working on queer stories. Got it. However, if uh, I've never choreographed an orgy. Okay. So if someone wanted hair, I would either be like, I'm gonna go talk to some friends and come back with a plan. Or I might be like, you know what? My friend Laura would be great for this. Mm. Uh, it was a story that has a lot of where the, um, hmm. the story is about race. I would recommend a BIPOC intimacy choreographer. <clears throat> right. Because I'm probably not the best person for that. I'm not specialized in that. Right. So that's even interesting to me. I didn't know that you'd have specialties. Do you know what I mean as well? So that's even interesting too. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I, when I work on BDSM kink projects, I don't assume that the actors have any experience with it. And so part of my job feels a little bit like a dramaturg. Also, <laughs> While choreographing, I'll also send the actors resources to read about like, uh, what is breath play? Why do people choke? What is the benefit? Why would these characters be doing this? I'll give them also the like, help with their backstory. Got so, it. So that if an actor isn't particularly comfortable, they don't have to like deep dive into the internet. Right. <laughs> if they want to, I go yeah. for it. Sure. Um, that's the thing I choose, and every intimacy choreographer is going to be different, but that's the thing I choose to do is to also provide some resources for research. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, okay. okay, so this is from, who is this from? Let me see, go back to Facebook. Oh, this is from Noreen. Hi, Noreen. Noreen says, how are intimate, explicit scenes, how are they outlined in your contract? Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're offered the role before you've seen the full script, how is it typically communicated to you of what exactly will be involved? Because each explicit scene can have different things. That's a great question. That is a great, great question. The first thing I will say is if a role is offered to you, ask to see the script. Now, yeah. I know that on camera, that's less, sometimes less possible than uh, the theater. And mm -hmm. even the theater, if we're working on a new play, it might not completely be there. Right. Um, nudity, you should have a nudity writer. Um, and uh, in theater, a thing I do is we do a nudity contract that the stage manager, costume team, director, and actors all sign, oh. um, which is the same idea. And it's not meant to be like a contract. It's meant as a form of communication. Right. Right. We want to make sure that everyone involved understands what they're signing up for. Yeah. And I think that's where this, the heart of this question is, how do I know what I'm signing up for? Yeah. And I think ask is a big part of it. 
like ask like what are all the possibilities right and, and and I would say too, like, why wouldn't you get the script? Like, I can understand if it's not done yet, or maybe it's improv based. Yeah. But then there needs to be an outline, at least a treatment of what the story is going to be, so you're aware. But I never accept a project unless I read the script because I've, I've yeah. literally never accepted a project that I haven't read the script either. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's a, a thing too. It's like when I heard the question, I was thinking like, well, yeah. I mean, if you're cast as a series regular, the final episode might not be written. But right. You're to get each episode at a time yeah right uh, but also that could be a red flag if there if it's something really sexually explicit and you haven't been offered a full script that's a thing to ask the team like where's like where's the script and what are you expecting mm -hmm. i always start on a project by asking the team what's the purpose of the nudity or what's the purpose of this scene and mm -hmm. how to forward the story mm -hmm. So right. we need to find the right story. Totally, so important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking back. I'm like, I don't think in my 20s I read scripts. I was like, I'll do it, I'll do it, just let me do it. But I think, you know, I think the older I got, I was like, I'm always going to read the script. But I think that just again speaks to what we talked about at the beginning, which is why I think this conversation is so important. Is we tend to give our power away because we just want to work and we'll do anything to get a credit or be paid. And it's just so important to tap into your own fucking truth of who you are and what you want out of your own career and what you're comfortable with. And there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. When I was very young, I got offered a role on camera that included a, a shower scene. Mm. And I did get to read the whole script. Okay. And I, at the time, wasn't the advocate for myself that I am now. And I just hoped it would be okay. And I like, talked it over with a bunch of friends. Like, what will I say if I have to be totally naked? And I knew they couldn't ask me to do total nudity because they hadn't put that in the in the contract. But I didn't yeah. know what they would want to show. I didn't know what or like what they. I didn't really know. And I was very very lucky that the team was amazing. Yeah. And it was something I was totally comfortable with, and I had a great time. Good. But I, wish I could go back and tell young Brooke, oh, <laughs> ask ask right. for permission. It's okay. Mm hmm. Totally. Mm -hmm. Um. But I think I, my, my, I think I mentioned this story to you, Brooke. Actually, when we chatted months ago about <laughs> doing this workshop, um, one of my the first feature that I produced, there was nudity in, and mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we asked people if they were comfortable with that. Obviously, um, we gave the part to a woman. She signed the nudity writer. She read the script. She knew exactly what it was. She signed the the consent form. We got to set. I was the one talking her you know through everything as the producer because the director was male and the other producer was male and she got to set and said i'm not doing it and i didn't know what to do like i, I didn't have an intimacy choreographer to support in that mm -hmm. case me my first time producing trying to figure out my way and going oh my god right we can't like i'll be lost like two hours or maybe three hours of shoot time because she wouldn't do it and I had to call her agent and the agent called her and yelled at her. And it was this whole horrible experience. Mm -hmm. And as a woman, I felt terrible, like I'm making this woman do nudity that she signed up to do. It was just a horrible experience. Um, she ended up doing it. Um, but then at the end of the day, we couldn't even use that footage because she was just, it was, you could just tell she wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? And we yeah. ended up having to reshoot. I mean, was, that cost us probably another 60 grand, which, on an indie film is a lot of money, you know? So it's just it's just interesting how a lot of those issues could be solved, number one, by having int intimacy choreographer, but also mm -hmm. number two, if she wasn't comfortable, like just being honest with yourself. And I think that's the biggest thing is going back to boundaries. Like you said, like, yeah, on paper, that sounded great. I got a job, I get paid, you know, $900, but you know, what are you comfortable with? And that it's okay to say no, as you said before. Yeah, and that's the thing. Most people in our industry are great people yeah. and do not want to force someone to do something that they don't want to do. Right, right. And that's why, I mean, one of the great things about being in this pause in our industry right now is we all have time for self-reflection. Yeah. And I recognize I am not saying that means all of you aren't working and have oodles of time and are just watching that <laughs> reflecting on yourself. I recognize that's not true. <laughs> But we're not, most of us aren't going to work on set right now or in a rehearsal room. Mm -hmm. And 
it's a really beautiful opportunity for us to take time and think, what am I okay with? Because ultimately, we are the only ones who can take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a big conversation in the intimacy industry about whether or not intimacy choreographers are responsible for the safety of an actor. Mm -hmm. um, and I would argue that we are not. Huh. Um, and there are plenty of people who will disagree with me, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's actually possible. Mm -hmm. I think I'm there to make sure everyone has all the information. Yeah. <clears throat> Articulate boundaries, make sure everyone understands boundaries to make gorgeous, awesome choreography. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I cannot get inside another human and tell exactly what they're comfortable with right. on that person. Mm -hmm. and so that, that is why I'm hoping it will become standard in actor training. Yeah. I play a game with my students called Take the Job or Leave the Job. <laughs> Where I'll give them like a, a wild scenario, always based on a real scenario from my, my friends. And yep. then I'll say, take the job or leave the job, no wrong answers. And then we'll break up onto two sides of the room and battle it out. <laughs> and ultimately, there are no wrong answers. Right. It's all about what you will want. Right. I'll always do a couple that have to do with nudity for that exact reason. And then we read Lauren Graham, uh, Graham's book, um, Someday, Someday, Maybe. Oh, I haven't read that yet. It's a be it's a beautiful little novel that she wrote about like a woman in the eighties trying to make it as an actor in New York. Um, and at one point in the book, spoiler, she gets cast in something involving nudity and goes through this dilemma herself. And it's interesting before reading the book, people's answers are often one thing and after sometimes they're different. Oh, interesting. And so I feel like part of our job as an actor is to tap into what are we enthusiastically ready to consent to? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's huge. That's huge. Um, OK, I'm, I want to get to Chris has a great question, but I, I but just I want to keep um, I'm going to come back to your question, Chris. I see you. Um, but I, to that end of what we're comfortable with, kid, just before we run out of time, not that we have we still have 20 minutes, but I do want to talk about going back to set in COVID times of COVID. Things are opening up. Our numbers are increasing here in California, which is oh so exciting as everything's opening. Um, but man, how do we become advocates for ourselves in this time with all the you know the new protocols and everything that's there? Um, it's just still a little you know uh, intense. It's still a little scary, you know, especially in the non-union world. I think even more so because when they're not having all the SAG after protocols, I, my husband works on a Disney TV show. I'm watching them, you know, coordinate everything right now, and they're series budget for their TV show went up by $1.7 million with all of the PPE costs and COVID cool. costs attached to it. So of course, non-union is not going to have that amount of money or even indie films. I'm worried about the future of indie films for the next year. Um, so how, how, how does this all play into this? How with boundaries and consent? I'm so glad you brought this up. This is such a great question. Um, if you are a non-union actor watching right now, Familiar, familiarize yourself with what the unions are saying as a bare minimum for us to go back to set. Great. And if you are asked to participate in a project that is not following these protocols, ask yourself if this is really the moment that you need to do it. Mm -hmm. um, man, I was panicking about this career a few weeks ago and my therapist was like, you just have to find a way to make it through the next two years. We're gonna have a lot more information. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah. That's true. Yeah. Like, Remember back in March when we're like, in two months, we'll all be back. Remember that time? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, but I was like, what am I going to do every job I have? No one's paying me to be an intimacy choreographer right now. That's for sure. You right. know? Right. Um, and my acting work is highly diminished. Right. Uh, so anyway, I want to say I'm glad you brought up non-union because if you're a non-union actor, that does not mean you can't read the sag after what sag after is saying and what Actors' Equity is saying. I took a huge sigh of relief when Actors' Equity released, like, you will not go back to work until these things are happening. Yeah, yep. I was like, yep. great. So uh, the reason the unions exist is to help actors not be exploited. If you are non-union, just because you're not part of the union doesn't mean you can't protect yourself. Yeah, totally. Um, so totally. I, th I think that. And then I think another thing that's really interesting is because we've all been apart for so long, we've all had differing levels of touch. 
and touch is gonna mean something different. I was telling Jody this right before we logged on, yeah, yeah. Um, but I live in a, uh, I live mostly alone. Um, I have a roommate that's here a couple days a week sometimes. Okay. Um, so I had not touched anyone in three and a half months. And I, I love physical touch. And my skin thirst was so strong that like a fly would land on my arm and I wouldn't flick it away because it was so interesting to feel another being on me. Oh my God. Me, that's a cinematic moment. <laughs> um, and when I had my first hug this past Friday, it shook me. So I think that's also a thing for each of us to think about. Um, this time of social distancing has been different for different people. Yeah. And what, number one, it's going to affect our storytelling. Touch is going to be different in our stories now. Yeah. Um, and also what you were comfortable with before COVID may not be the same now. And it's huh. okay to give yourself right. some time to pause and breathe and figure that out. Right. Um, right. Gosh, I didn't even think about that. Right. What was the phrase you just used? Skin thirst. I've Skin never thirst. heard that. I've oh, never heard that yeah. phrase. Oh, I don't know. It's not my phrase, but yeah, this idea of, um, do you know the idea of the five love languages? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So quality time, words of affirmation, physical uh, touch, uh, acts of service and gifts. Yes. And the idea is that these are five ways in which people give and receive love. Mm -hmm. My top, is I've, I'm always like words of affirmation, quality time and physical touch. And they, during my life, they've shifted and sure. physical touch is always up there. Uh, when yeah. I think of all my great relationships, romantic or otherwise, physical touch is a big part of them. Mm -hmm. So the loss of that yeah. is uh, makes me like hunger or thirst for Got it. Oh God, I just loved that. It was so juicy when you said it. It's like, yeah. oh. Give me a visceral feeling. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so all right, we're talking about uh, oh, here's here's a question. Do you recommend any literature regarding intimacy coordination? What a great question! I'm so glad you asked. I have two books sitting right here. Ah. <laughs> um, intimacy coordination specifically, John Bu 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 Buker's book, Bucher's book. I should have learned how to say his last name. I'm sorry, John. A book <laughs> guide to sex and storytelling, filming scenes with sex and nudity. It's a fantastic book that's broken into. Um, different chapters covering different uh, categories. And like there's a chapter on nudity and then there's an interview with Ida O'Brien, who's a uh, intimacy director in the UK. Mm -hmm. And so each chapter he'll talk a little bit about a particular thing and then he'll do an interview with someone working in the field. Oh, interesting. And it's a great resource. And it mm -hmm. has pre-production, post-production, stuff for actors, um, a very small section on LGBTQ I wish was longer. That's okay. That's another book for the future. Um, another book I really love. I'll write that book. Maybe, yeah. Um, <laughs> Chelsea Pace uh, with uh, Laura Rickard, who are friends of mine, wrote this book called Staging Sex. Great. And Laura Rickard and Chelsea Pace are the founders of Theatrical Intimacy Education, which is a great organization that teaches people to work in this field. Mm -hmm. um, and about this field. And this is like a handbook for oh. how to stage intimacy. Oh, great. Wow. Really lovely, it's very user friendly. I, It's like a great book to read if you're a director and you're just curious about it, or if you're an actor and you're curious about it, or you're a human and you're curious about it. Um, but like when I use the phrase ingredients before, that's just mm -hmm. word. There's like a whole, like here, I just flipped to it. Here are the ingredients. Um, and I yeah. have, I have slightly different ingredients than Chelsea uses, but I love that idea of it's a recipe. Yeah. So yes, great question. Thanks for asking. I love that. And, and look, I mean, as, as actors, we educate ourselves on lots of things. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like we had to educate ourselves on self tapes and educate how to do those and you know, audition technique or musical theater, or whatever you do. We educate ourselves in so many facets. Why wouldn't you educate yourself on this when Absolutely. it is something so vulnerable? Absolutely. And tons of people are writing about it too. There's tons of like, interviews out there and like on HowlRound, which is a theater website for those of you that don't know, oh. there's a ton of conversation going on right now. So there's a lot of places you can just read about online too. Adam Noble has a great article on extreme physicality that when I was early in this work, I found really useful. Okay. Great. 
that's now also an intimacy uh, coordinator and choreographer and director, I think. Got it. Great. Yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah. Like you don't know what you don't know. I always say that, right? So it's just this is a fascinating conversation of you don't know what you don't know. And look at all the tools that are actually available to us to educate ourselves, to take a stand from a place of power, as opposed to not wanting to rock the boat, like Katie had said earlier, which we tend to feel. So I love this. Mm -hmm. I do want to go back to just talking about the reopening. Yeah, great. A little bit. Like I know, you know, it's going to be a little bit more time for theater, obviously, than for uh, film and television. Um, but I do want to say, if you haven't read the, is a 37 page white paper that was released on the step protocols. I'll post that again I'll, uh, in this video later, just to educate yourself if you haven't read that about how sets will be run, um, SAG after sets will be run. Um, but what can we do now? as actors with the industry reopening, how can we be ready for that? What can what can we do? Mm -hmm. That's great. I mean, I think one of the first things I think is recognize uh, that you were brought up in a culture of yes and. Okay. That it's changing and that you have the power to start to control what, if you haven't already, some of us have, right? Some people have, I'm not trying to say that everyone's been doing it wrong. People have been doing things very right also. But, but take a moment to reflect and be like, these are the projects I want to work on. This is how I'm going to practice articulating your boundaries with someone. Mm -hmm. Recognize that one person might be different than another. Mm -hmm. And this is really important to me. In my rehearsal rooms, we never explain or justify our boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important. Number one, on set or in the rehearsal room, we don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. And then, because I might be like, uh, today my... Uh, I don't want anyone touching my shoulders because I went to the beach this weekend and I got a sunburn and they're just a little bit tender. And then somebody else is like, oh, what beach did you go to? Oh my goodness, I went to Far Rockaway, right? And now we're like spiraled and it's not useful time, right? Right, right. And also be like, also I don't want my elbow touched. And it's because I was on the train and someone grabbed me. Um. And maybe I don't want to have to justify that or I don't want to have to tell you about childhood trauma. So by creating a culture where we just set our boundaries and don't justify them, Mm -hmm. we're helping everyone. I love so, that. Um, so I think deciding now without the heightened stakes of a job offer and money in our face and the excitement of working again, what you actually want to work on. I think that's huge. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, if you tend to work in traumatic storytelling, have a self care plan in place for yourself. Because one thing an intimacy choreographer is not is your therapist. <laughs> um, a lot of people have done like mental health first yeah. aid and a lot of us are deeply empathetic and have really good uh, the word is escaping me but the ability to see someone is stuck and be like we're going to need a break now. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Sure. You don't depend on your therapist. So having a self-care plan in place if you if you do work in a lot of traumatic storytelling is useful. Yeah, and then that kind of leads me to, to Chris's question. Uh, could you talk about your PTSD like cool down exercise in relationship to triggering having an acting uh, acting breakthrough intense performance? Do you do that with your choreographed actors? Mm -hmm. Also look forward to seeing your type on set. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. So lots of people have been working in the field of this intimacy warm down uh, along, alongside of me. Um, and different intimacy choreographers have different techniques. Um, mm -hmm. Intimacy Directors International, which doesn't exist anymore. They're now, a lot of the same people are now intimacy directors and choreographers. When I studied with Judy Ockler, they do a thing called tapping in and tapping out, which is literally as easy as just like, if this is you and this is me being like, and now we're our characters. And at the end we say, thank you. And we're out and we're recognizing that we're not our characters anymore. Got it. Interesting. The mm -hmm. education does a thing called D rolling where I would say like, as my, and I don't use this enough, so I hope I don't watch it, but like as my character, I was angry and I slapped you because you were being mean to me or whatever. Mm -hmm. As the actor, I did my job by following the choreography and did did it to keep you safe, to like differentiate between the two. 
Hmm. Uh, process that's the, this 20 minute project process, which can be shorter if someone's not really triggered. I do it with my students in class. We do it at the end of every class. Oh, wow. Uh, end of almost every class. Um, uh, and I teach it in rehearsal processes where the team has provided me with enough time because it does take time. Right. Um, but it invo- it's a three part thing, which is a meditative part, a physical part. So like when we're in positions of grief and fear, we're, you know, yeah. so the, the idea of yoga to open us back up. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some vocal uh, audible exhale to get to let it out on sound. And it always, it always ends with one of two things, a power pose, because power poses have been physiologically proven to make us feel more confident. I love so it. For two minutes. And during that time, if it's in a group, I'll like ask questions that are about you, not about your character, to bring to remind us that we are ourselves. Right. And then sometimes we end with a dance party because that's just fun. <laughs> um, I'm definitely yeah. a fan of dance parties. That's the two minute version of how you can do a warm down. I love it. Yeah. Well, and, and it's good. It, I mean, that kind of touches upon, you know, um, the mind, body, spirit, if you think about it, right? Like getting back in your body, opening up the body, breathing, getting the, the spirit and the breath moving. And then, you know, the mind of this is who I am. This is what I want. This is why I'm in the world. Power pose. <laughs> yeah. The meditation part of it. I always ask these questions. Um, like, What's something today, what's something about your work today that you did that you're proud of and honor that? Love that. Is there something you wish you could have done differently? That's okay. Take a moment to acknowledge it, name it, and then choose to let it go. Mm-hmm. And is there an artistic goal that you're working on today? Take a moment to mm-hmm. check out that. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that's- it's really great because it is, you know, getting caught up in the emotion of that, what you're playing. It's, it's hard to just flip the switch, you yeah. know? And I do that little chunk after every audition. Mm. I have a way to leave the audition in the space. I'll go back to the bathroom or the dressing room or wherever and just be like, what's something I'm proud of? Is there anything I wish I could have done differently? Yep. Okay. I'm going to let it go. And did I accomplish an artistic goal? Oh my God. I'm writing this down. What's something I'm proud of? <laughs> what was your- What's that? You honor it. Pick, is there anything you wish you could have done differently? Acknowledge it, name it, let it go. Mm-hmm. Yep. And do you have an artistic goal that you're working on? Because that's what I try to bring into an audition rather than I need to book this. Like today right. I'm on my breath or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, your artistic goal and see if you're able to accomplish it. Oh, I love it. I'm writing that in the notes for people. Great. Ah, that was beautiful. All right. Um, let me get back to our page here. Um, someone just said, is this going to be uh, this amazing conversation? Is there going to be a replay? Yes. Um, the, the playback will be in this Facebook group. And if you have signed up for the wellness webinar series, it will be on a landing page that you will have forever that you can go back and listen to that and share with people. So there that as well. So, so, okay. So I love this that we're talking about, you know, the, um, the cool down or warm down. Mm-hmm. So, and, and we're talking about going back to set in self care. Are there other like uh, any other self care practices that you would would recommend um, uh, for actor, or is that that's really what you're what we're talking about right now? I think there's. I mean, I think everyone's self care is personal, and mm-hmm. there's plenty. Like, what do you do after for you yourself when you're having a, a a hard down set or something? Do you have a self care thing you do? <gasps> I do. Um, I mean, meditation is a big part of it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Centering yourself and, um, and grounding. Um, uh, breath work for me to get back in my body because I know if I'm having a hard time for me, I'm usually in my head about things. So uh, the the release thereof. Um, sometimes journaling. It depends if I just need to like get something out that is just spiraling in my brain. Um, it could be that. Um, but I also do love dance parties. Like if I'm just like, yeah. I just need to get this out, you know, like just get it out. Feels do you good. have someone in your life that is like your kind of like a creative accountability partner that if you need to process something with outside yeah. of set that you can talk to? Definitely. Yeah. That's cause like my accountability part, I have an accountability partner I speak to daily. It was Laura who was our, our Reiki guest, uh, last okay. week. 
Um, we've been accountability partners for four years, uh, actually speaking at least four or five days a week. Um, and uh, yeah, so we we talk about like our accountability is a lot of not just what we're doing, but how we're being. And we'll yeah. say what comes up for us and how we're and how we're being triggered and what happens or if they, and we're always like, if something happens in the day, call me. So if I get triggered or start spiraling, she's the first person that I call. And I think it's really yeah. important to have that outlet. I think finding that person in your life is so important. I have one, I have a couple people in my life like that, but my accountability partner as well. Yeah. Good. Dare. Wonderful human. Um, (laughs) And uh, I also think, I mean, I full on recommend therapy. I think as actors, we are asked to like damage and scar (laughs) ourselves. We're living life, often living lives of trauma and we're doing it bravely and by choice, Mm -hmm. but it can take a toll. Um, We, we we live that experience. I think therapists are wonderful, um, but I, I do think having someone to process what you're going through outside of the creative team is very healthy. Yeah, and sometimes even this like I just just had a self tape that popped in my head where it was um, I was trapped in a bathroom with a shooter outside, so it's like crying, and it was like two camera like on your phone sending like my husband a message. Yeah, and that was like oh, like I had I had to go for like a walk around the block after that just to like shed it. Like I think just walking and like again yeah. getting back in your body is really important. But yeah, we we do put ourselves through emotional roller coasters on a yeah. daily basis, <laughs> even yeah. just by the pursuit of being an actor. Do you know what I mean? It's an yeah. emotional coaster. Absolutely, I love it just though because you got outside, which is helpful, and you yeah. walked. And I bet what you were doing is giving yourself that 20 minute window for your adrenaline to come down. Probably. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I never thought of it in that way. I love that. That you said adrenaline last 20 minutes. It's such a great thing to remember. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes I get impatient. Like, oh, just let it go. Like it's, you know, oh, just do it. <laughs> yeah. So it's nice to actually give yourself the space. Yeah. So we have a couple more minutes here. If you have any other questions for Brooke, um, please ask them now. If someone asked, what was the name of the second book? Stage um, I think- sex. Aging sex, yeah. There we go. That. That's, that's, I'm gonna check that out. That sounds really it's awesome. great. Um, there's also other, there's like plenty of organizations that if you're interested in this work, you can train with. And James just started Intimacy Directors and Coordinators of Color, which is really oh, exciting. Okay. Um, Amanda okay. Bloomball has uh, Intimacy Professionals Association, I think, IPA in LA. Um, we talked about IDC and CIE. I think apprenticing or shadowing with someone can be great. Mm-hmm. Ask. This is a thing I didn't say. When you book a job, ask, yeah. will there be an intimacy choreographer? <laughs> right? right? Because that's a great question. A good one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I was copying some of your links in the in the chat for people, too. Do that. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> oh. Thank you. Me down the wrong pipe. Wrong um, yeah, just to ask. And if there's not, then how are you going to be handling this on set? When can we, you know, will we have set conversation, have time to converse with the director and the actors? It just goes back to everything that we were saying in the beginning of we get to be our own advocates. We get to stand mm-hmm. in our power no matter what, you know, and just because we want to work doesn't mean we have to sacrifice our integrity and our value system, you know? Yeah, I love, I always have loved how you use we get to. (laughs) Thanks. Uh, And I think that's a really great way to look at this industry too, because I think there's a lot of people that are like, oh, I got to get an intimacy choreographer so I don't get sued or whatever, right? (laughs) Right. Because a lot of the work did come out of the Me Too movement. But the truth is we get to save time by communicating in advance. Mm-hmm. And none of this work is heavy. It's almost always just full of joy. Yeah. And yeah. it's really, yeah. Right, because clarity, clarity does bring joy. If there's clarity in a situation, then there's ease in a situation, which automatically brings joy as opposed to fear and the unknown, which closes us off. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Um, 
right, so so I want to read this. Katie wrote this thing. It's really long to put on the screen, but she was talking about um, she was offered a role where the character was supposed to be in her underwear. She was, mm -hmm. she was okay with, but then she read the script, noticed that it had nude but covered up in blankets in a scene that wasn't disclosed um, to her originally, and then she turned it down because it was, she was not told about it. And she mm -hmm. couldn't help but think if they didn't tell me about that before reading the script, what will they throw at me when I'm on set? And to this day, I don't regret my decision. I think that's really important, right? Being able yeah. to move between the lines of, if they don't tell me this upfront and people aren't clear about it, I mean, yeah. that's the relationships and friendships, right? Like that's with anything. If people aren't clear yeah. about things up front, what else are you going to uncover? So I think that's really, thank you for sharing that story, Katie. I think that's really yeah. important because that took courage. So that's what Brooke has been saying. It's about bravery and courage to, to dive into this work um and again uh being okay to say no mm -hmm. and knowing that you have the power to ask for what you need and want absolutely and look people make mistakes and things do change right there's a world in which you show up on set and they've changed their mind and they want yeah. to do something differently but then they need to give you the time to think about it right yeah and back to it you shouldn't have to be especially shouldn't be asked to make a decision day of on set yeah Right, right. And That's not if your gut. What I love about what Katie just said was if they didn't do this, like she recognized the red flag mm -hmm. and, and I've never regretted it. Mm -hmm. If you're telling you something isn't right, mm -hmm. something isn't right. Mm -hmm. totally. Yeah, the faster we and, and not not to eliminate any of our, our, our male listeners but i think for women it's so important to listen to that intuition you yeah. know i don't think we, we don't you know god it's so important like what, that feeling that you get like right here do you know what i mean and then we just ignore it it's like that you got to be able to tap into that and recognize that and i feel like Absolutely. it starts to come with age but also come with awareness i think so Absolutely. and i want to say to that two things one katie gave herself a great gift because she taught herself that she can trust herself. Yes. Right? That's mm -hmm. awesome. And then I'm really glad you said, uh, not to disregard the men, because I also want to say that like it's really easy um, in our society to think that like we need to take care of the women, the men will be fine. Sure. And I say for any men, anyone of any gender listening, yeah. my job on on your set or in your rehearsal room is not to see your gender, to see your app. I mean, for storytelling purposes, we see gender, but I mean, as, as far as how we negotiate this work, there are not perpetrators. There are not people that are more or less vulnerable. Everyone is an actor. Mm -hmm. Everyone deserves to have boundaries and have those mm. protected. And what we, how we've taught guys to be tough or whatever. Right. That, like I am trained to not do to check in with everyone equally. I love that. Yeah. So important. Oh God, this was such a great conversation. We're two minutes over. Um, okay. This was so wonderful, Brooke. I really, like I could talk to you for another like two hours about this stuff. Like it's it's such an important conversation to be had just because like you said, it, it touches, it taps into the deepest part of our, our vulnerable selves. Yeah. You know, and, and sometimes some of us, I think, are telling the stories that we tell to even heal traumas that we've had. And how are we balancing that in the in work and in life? Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I just love this. So so is there anything you want to leave leave our audience with my community with today? Any last thoughts of how to how to move forward or to begin one's education with this or next steps? I want to say thanks for like there's so much content. Thank you for taking the time to learn about this. It's so yeah. I feel honored that you would do that, that you would spend this time with us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can find me if you have questions. That's always possible. Right. Uh, and and Jody, I really I want to say again, I really appreciate that you are prioritizing this. It's oh, yeah. it, is, it is part of my activism, and I feel like you are um, helping with that and bringing bringing this education to a wider audience. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's necessary. So, and we all get to support each other. And I think this is part of the support that mm -hmm. gets to be out there, right? So I'm, I'm sure uh, this conversation will be continued. And if you do have questions, um, I did put Brooke's uh, website 
and I think your Instagram, whatever you would give me, is, is, is in this post. I'll make sure that it's in there. Um, and yeah, so reach out to her with questions. Reach out to her to work on sets or theater productions that you're booking. <laughs> um, that would be great. Um, and let's just keep the the education of this going and, and remember that we get to put ourselves first. In Can I say one more thing? I know that was such a beautiful wrap up. Thank you so oh, much. What? Um, also, change is hard. Yeah. And every little bit that we get better is good. And yeah. if you do something that you later regret, that's okay. We don't have to do this perfectly. Even as an intimacy choreographer, I sometimes make mistakes. Yeah. I'm still constantly learning. So, mm -hmm. uh, and the industry is growing. So give yourself grace if there's something that you don't handle perfectly. Mm -hmm. And give yourself grace if mistakes are made. Um, because as Chelsea Pace would say, better is better. <laughs> okay. I love, it. I love it. That was so well said. Uh, all right, Brooke, thank you so much for being yeah. here. Um, thank you all for tuning in to our final episode of the wellness webinar series. Um, I'm going to keep registration open for the series through Sunday. Um, and then I'll be taking down the registration. But if you do want to have access to these videos and all in one place, you can, you'll have till Sunday to do that if you haven't already. Uh, but thank you, Brooke, for being here. Um, I will uh, see you all in the Facebook group and around as we continue supporting each other. Okay, bye. bye.